afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am very happy to be here to talk to you about food and food security related matters, especially before lunch. Talking about food is a good idea. You know, 1962, we had a war with China. 1965, we had a war with Pakistan. In between those two wars, India was waging a war against hunger and food shortages. If you remember, we used to get wheat donated by US through PL 480, and we were living ship to mouth. It actually forced the Prime Minister to appeal to the people to give up one meal a week. Prime Minister Shastri did that. And I remember, I was seven, eight years old at that time, and I was, my father was a, a revenue divisional officer, and he had an office room at home. I used to stand in that room and watch him doing his official duties. I didn't understand much, but it gave me a lot of kick to observe that. And I remember one person coming and pleading with him to a lot, 10 kilos of wheat and 5 kilos of sugar for his daughter's marriage. And my father had to tell him very, very nicely that so much cannot be spared. And he was given only 5 kilos of wheat and 2 kilos of sugar. Those were difficult times. But by the time we had the next war, 1971, war against Pakistan, we had overcome this food issue. And we were more or less self-sufficient by 1971, courtesy Green Revolution. Green Revolution made a huge impact on the agricultural productivity in the country. And we are, even today, self-sufficient in rice and wheat. After about 30 years of Green Revolution, we started experiencing, again, the challenges of food security. And one of the reasons for this is the population growth. You know, the world population has gone up to 7.3 billion today. We added a billion in the last 12 years. Indian population today is 130 crores, which is again going to be, we are going to be the largest populated country in the world by 2035. And we are likely to touch 170 crores by 2050. So this actually throws up along with, and if you observe the most important statement here, the amount of food the world will consume in the next 50 years is double the amount of food that the world consumed in the last 10,000 years. Can you believe that? That is a challenge in front of us. That is a challenge in front of agricultural scientists, the farmers, industry, and the population, consumers in general. In this background, we have to look at, and of course, the climate change. Climate change is real. It is already started affecting the agricultural yields. And in another 20 years' time, it is expected to affect agricultural yields in a much more severe fashion. So in this background, we have to define what is food security. Our food security means there are three dimensions to that. Availability, which is related to production of food. Accessibility, which is related to distribution of food. And third is affordability. Billions of people in the world live below poverty line. In India itself, we have 20, 25% of our people who live below poverty line. So food has to be affordable. Expensive food is not the answer to the food security situation. So in that context, if we have to look at what are all the challenge, what are all the options available to us, the greatest impact on agriculture was made by genetic modification in the last 20 years. What is genetic modification? It means moving a gene across organisms. The organisms could be related, they could be unrelated. So you could move a gene from a plant or some other organism into a crop to improve certain parts of the crop. This is called a trait. You transfer a gene, thereby you transfer a trait. A trait is nothing but a character. There are different types of traits, which, so all the genetic modification is a generic term, but there are different types of traits. So if you see here, genetic modification is a very precise science. When you move a gene in a traditional way, along with that gene, many other genes also move. But in genetic modification, you can move a gene very precisely and in a very quick fashion. So that's why, it is a much more precise and quick science. There are different types of biotech traits. There are what are called input traits, and there are what are called output traits. Input traits are those which affect or which change the way we use inputs on a crop. It could be related to water, pesticides. It could be related to fertilizers. The output traits are those which change the profile of the output of a crop. You could change the composition of oil seeds, for example to make that oil much more healthy. You could change the composition of rice, for example,
to incorporate some vitamins in rice. Those are all called output traits. But so far, the world has seen mostly the input traits. And if you see, currently 180 million hectares of land is cultivated with GM crops in the world, which is 12% of the total acreage in the world. This is done in 28 countries. Out of that, 20 countries are developing countries. 18 million farmers across the world from developing countries have used this technology, and they're very happy with that. There are eight countries, developing, developed countries, which are using this technology. India is among the top five countries using this technology. You can see the list there, US is at the top, but India is at the fourth, fourth level. So we have actually adopted through only one crop, which is called BT cotton. There is also 14.3 million farmers in India and China who are using it, and 18 million resource poor farmers who are using it. And some of the countries like Indonesia and Vietnam and even Bangladesh have introduced this technology. This is what I was talking about, the biotech traits in agriculture. You see the insect resistance, which is the input trait here. It changes the way we use pesticides. Herbicide tolerance, it changes the way we use weed management. These two really dominate the world today. 98% of the GM crops uh, carry these two traits. Three crops, or let's say four crops, really dominate today. First is uh, soybean, second is maize, third is cotton, and fourth is canola. These are the four crops all over the world which have actually adopted this technology in a much greater fashion. Although there are 29 crops where GM has been done, and they're approved for use by the regulators across the world. But really speaking, it is so, these four crops which dominate. So as you can see here, herbicide tolerance, water use efficiency, which reduces the amount of water that we use for cultivation, disease tolerance, these are all already in the market. Things like fertilizer use efficiency, salinity tolerance, and heat tolerance, particularly for countries like us, uh, I don't know whether you are aware, we have 20 million hectares of land in India, which is saline. So the farmers, millions of farmers suffer there. So there is a gene which can help us to grow crops in those fields. So there are many trades which are available in the international markets. They are getting commercialized and they can get commercialized in India. So what about the effectiveness? What have they delivered so far? If you see National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, USA, has just published a report in 2016 called Genetically Engineered Crops, Experiences and Prospects, where they have concluded that favorable economic outcomes for producers have been achieved with this. It's a very comprehensive study. It was done over a period of two years, and these are the conclusions of that. There is a study done by, this is called a meta-analysis, done by <laughs> Dr. Kaim and Dr. Klumpa from Göttingen University in Germany, which has concluded that GM crops have reduced chemical pesticides used by 37%, increased crop yields by 22%, and increased farmers' profits by 68%. So it's a huge impact. It is such a huge impact that 180 million hectares are covered with the crop today. And they have also concluded that most of the farmers from developing countries have got better profits uh, from GM crops. In India, I don't know whether you can see this clearly, but India has had experience only with BT cotton so far. This is the only crop approved in 2002. When it was approved, we were an importer of cotton. We were producing 13 million bales of cotton. Today, we are the second largest exporter of cotton. We are the largest cotton producing country in the world. And our yields have gone up to 500 kilos per hectare from 300 kilos per hectare. Farmers have realized more profits of the 8,000 rupees per acre. So it had a huge impact, socioeconomic impact. Even the people, the women who pick cotton, this is all done by women and their incomes have gone up because they had to pick more cotton. We are now producing three times more cotton what we were producing in 2002. There is always a debate about the safety of the technology, and there is enough evidence, and there are enough endorsements by leading institutions about the safety of the technology, including FAO, WHO, even European Union, which actually doesn't grow much of GM crops, but they have endorsed the safety of the technology that's why more than 25 different GM foods are allowed for import and consumption in Europe. The regulation is a highly regulated industry. It's a highly regulated technology. And the regulatory uh, robustness makes sure that the technology which comes to us in the market 
is thoroughly tested and is safe for all of us. These are the types of tests that we do in India, which are prescribed by the regulators, including toxicity, allergenicity, and its uh, impact on the environment, including beneficial insects. The National Academies of Science, again, the same report, it has concluded that animals were not harmed by eating food derived from GE crops, and in which, uh, livestock health showed no ad adverse effects associated with GE crops, and finally found no substantial evidence that foods from GE crops were less safe than foods from non-GE crops. So these are all endorsements which have actually given us, and there are many more, more than 3,000 reports on G safety of GE crops are available on three leading uh, websites which you can refer to. GE crops have contributed substantially to the environment <coughs> by reducing the need for extra land to cultivate. What agricultural production the world has seen in 2014, if we had to do without the technology, we would have required 20.7 million hectares of additional land, which would have been plowed down. Plowing down of forests would have happened because of that. So it's, safe. it's a land-saving technology. But more importantly, it saves the emissions of carbon dioxide into the air. You know that agriculture is a, uh, agriculture uh, emits a lot of greenhouse gases. So if you can reduce that emissions, you can reduce CO2 emissions. The amount of CO2 saved in till now is equal to removing one crore cars from the roads for one year time. It's the biggest impact on the environment. So there are proven studies, established studies, which show these kind of benefits from the technology. I will come to what are the priority areas for India, because just because the technology is available, it is not necessary that we have to use it in all the places. We don't have to use it in all the crops in, and in all the places. We should also keep in mind that India is all the one country, but we have many layers of income levels and <coughs> many layers of market segments. We have the 20, 25% of our people who are below poverty line. We also have 10, 15% of our population, people who are as rich as anybody else in the world, and we have a huge middle class in between. So they all need different levels of pricing, different levels of how you actually produce, at what cost do we produce food? So, you know, I was in a supermarket yesterday. I saw the prices. You know, there are always normal foods and there are special foods which are being marketed today. If you take mustard, the normal one is 12 rupees for 100 grams and the special one is 30 rupees for 100 grams. Sugar, normal is 65 rupees per kg and the special one is 130 rupees per kg. Tamarind, 70 rupees per kg normal, 145 rupees per kg, the special one. I am not against the special ones. I am saying that these two are different markets. You cannot have a food security based on the special ones. You need for large part of the population, the lower priced ones, the affordable food. That is the most important point I am trying to say. I have identified three areas where we should focus as a country. Number one is pulses. We all know that our pulses production is not keeping up with the demand. Demand for pulses and edible oils are going up because of increasing income levels and increasing awareness levels. So pulses, currently we are importing almost 5 million tons, and this will grow more and more. There are three major constraints in pulses. One is a pest called Helicoverpa, which is the same pest which affects cotton. Water stress in pulses. Pulses are all grown in rain-fed areas. And hybridization is poor in pulses. For all these three, there are answers in GE technology, and BT, is the answer for the insect, and BT chickpea is under development. Hopefully, it will come into the market, but there is a need to introduce GM into more pulses to catch up with our requirements. Edible oils, we import. I don't know how many of you are aware that 65% of our edible oil consumption is imported, and it's a huge impact on our foreign exchange. We pay almost 70 to 80,000 crores every year for import of edible oils. Mustard is one of the largest grown uh, crops with yields which are substantially lower than the global yields. And mustard yields are low because hybridization is poor in mustard and also because of water stress. Again, GM mustard is developed by our own Delhi University it, and it is awaiting clearance from the government. It is, uh, its full application is ready and is available with GEAC 
which is a top body on the Ministry of Environment, <coughs> which actually clears these applications. Mitigating farmers, you know, you hear of farmer suicides, you hear of agriculture, rural distress among farming communities, and this is primarily driven by water, the lack of water or drought. So there is a technology which is called WUE, which is water use efficiency. It can help us to produce more per drop of water, and this is this can save up to 30% of water for us. You know that 92% of the water in the country is used for agriculture. So there is, whatever we can save in that, it will increase availability of either drinking water or it can be used for growing other crops. We consume a lot of fertilizers, nitrogenous and phosphatic fertilizers. In both the fertilizers, we can reduce the consumptions by using this gene called fertilizer use efficiency gene nitrogen use efficiency gene or phosphate use efficiency gene. And they will help us actually not only to reduce fertilizer cost for the farmer, but fertilizer subsidy for the government. And fertilizers have an adverse impact on the soil structures. So if you reduce the use of fertilizers, you can actually save the soils. So you can see some of the trial, <coughs> laboratory trial pictures in this, both the things. You know, nitrogen helps in above the ground growth and phosphorus helps in below the ground growth the root growth. So both are actually possible for us to achieve with this technology. And save, this is estimated that just between these two, we can save 3,000 crores for the farmer's cost and about 6,000 crores of subsidy for the government. Biotech can address other issues in agriculture like water, I mentioned. We use a lot of water for transplanted rice. It is possible to use a herbicide tolerant technology and there is no need to transplant rice with standing water. We use standing water in rice. Many people don't know. We use it just to kill weeds, not for anything else. But you have other means to kill weeds through this technology, and we'll be able to save water. Finally, I would like to say that why not GM technology? So why not? Because GM technology is a proven technology. It has established its performance in the last 20 years. It is a safe technology, as is endorsed by many uh, leading institutions through more than 3,000 studies. It, no single technology is a silver bullet. You cannot feed the whole population with using one single technology. So the real question is not whether to use GM or organic or chemicals. So I would like to conclude by saying that we should not shy away from using any technology for the fear of the unknown. Based on scientific evidence and the data, we should use technologies which are beneficial for us. If we don't do that, one of our future prime ministers may have to again say, please give up a meal per week, and we don't want that situation. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.